In 1988, two European male models named Rob Palatis and Fab Morvan signed with German music producer Frank Farian to form a new R&B vocal group. However, to their dismay, they discovered that the songs had already been recorded by other singers and that they'd only be the public face for music videos and promotional shoots. Having already spent their record advance, the duo decided to roll with it until they generated enough revenue to at least pay it back. The new group, Milli Vanilli, would go on to be a huge success in the world of pop music, generating five hit singles that topped the Billboard Hot 100, selling six million albums in America, and winning a Grammy for Best New Artist. However, rumors quickly started to circulate that Rob and Fab hadn't sung on the original recordings. And the rumors only got worse after the pair were revealed to be lip-syncing during a concert in Bristol, Connecticut. After paying hush money to quiet the rumors and weathering the duo's constant request to properly sing on the next release, Frank Farian eventually came clean and admitted that the group was a sham. Milli Vanilli remains the only Grammy winner to have their award straight up revoked, and 27 different lawsuits were filed on the part of record buyers claiming fraud. Their American record label, Arista, canceled their contract, deleted their master recordings from their back catalog, and let their albums go out of print. Pop music as a whole would fall out of favor for most of the decade, with audiences drifting towards alternative rock or gangster rap. Things wouldn't turn around until the late 90s with the rise of Britney Spears, the Backstreet Boys, and NSYNC, all of whom were constantly dogged with accusations of lip-syncing in the tabloids. Whether or not they actually were was beside the point. Long story short, the public didn't want another Milli Vanilli to happen. Stop! Hey, hold on a second. Wait. Oh. Oh. Man! As for Robin Fab, their attempts to regain the spotlight would be unsuccessful, with an album featuring their vocals proving to be a failure due to distribution problems and audience disinterest. In 1998, on the eve of a new record release and tour, Rob Pilatus was found dead via an overdose on alcohol and prescription pills. To this day, Milli Vanilli remains a pariah, and a cautionary tale about the exploitative nature of the music industry. And then there was that one time that they appeared on the Mario Brothers cartoon. Hey, Paisano! Eh, nope, nope, not that one. But I can certainly see why you'd think that. Produced by Deke Entertainment, the Super Mario Bros. Super Show is nostalgia goggles incarnate because it can't hold up under any other scrutiny. The animation mistakes aren't hard to spot, and instead of having an actual story, the writers just decided to do a different movie parody every episode and just plug Mario into it. Sherlock Holmes, but with Mario. Robin Hood, but with Mario. James Bond, but with Mario. The Road Warrior, but with Mario. Eraserhead, but with Mario. Okay, maybe not that last one, but you get the idea. That said, I'd be lying if I said I didn't still have some affection for this show. I mean, the voice I associated with Mario for the longest time wasn't Charles Martinet and it sure as shit wasn't Chris Pratt. It was Captain Lou Albano. That was more fun than getting flushed down a sewer! No, today we're talking about the sequel series, based off Super Mario Bros. 3. This one isn't remembered nearly as well, most likely because few people ever saw it. The network provided terrible marketing and couldn't even give it a secure time slot on Saturday mornings. At least that's how I remember it. God, I'm old. On the one hand, this series is much, much closer to the games, but this show never lets you forget that it came out in 1990. I mean, George and Barbara Bush even make an appearance. That's the President of the United States! If we don't get him and the White House back to the real world, Cootie Pie will ruin America! How can we help America when we can't even help ourselves? Uh, why are we complaining about Koopa kidnapping the Bushes? I think he just did us a favor. Hey Koopa, can you take the Trumps with you while you're at it? Also, because of budget cuts behind the scenes, they managed to make an already cheap looking show look even cheaper. And perhaps the most egregious sin of all, they replaced the voice cast. That means no more Lou Albano as Mario, no more Danny Wells as Luigi, and no more Jeannie Elias as the princess. However, they did keep Harvey Atkin as the voice of King Koopa and John Stalker as the voice of Toad. It's time to rock and roll! Yay! As a result of the three Mario cartoons that were produced by Deke, Mario 3 is kind of the weakest. It doesn't have the nostalgia factor that the Super Show had, and it's not a fountain of memes like the Mario World series was. There's no Mama Luigi to be found here if you catch my drift. Cool it, Caterpillar Breath! I'm not your mama? Mama Luigi? <laughs> so how did Millie Vanilli end up on this show? It beats me, honestly. But celebrity parodies weren't uncommon on the Super Show, and they frequently had guest stars during the live action segments. But this would be a rare occasion where the celebrity guests would be animated into the show itself. I mean, I can kind of get the logic. The producers were probably like, hey, these guys just sold six million records. This can only help raise our profile, right? Well, it did, but in the worst possible way, because Millie Vanilli guest starring on the Mario cartoon would end up being their last notable event in pop culture before the lip syncing scandal broke. Their guest appearance aired on October 27th, 1990, and Frank Farian came clean to the press on November 10th, 1990. Two weeks later. 
Under any other circumstances, this episode would just be forgotten, but because it's tied to such a major scandal, it's become a bizarre historical artifact. I mean, how often do you get a celebrity appearance just days before that person's celebrity comes crashing down completely? It'd be like fetching coffee for the creator of Dilbert before he goes to record his podcast. Ugh, I even hate saying the title of the episode. Cootie Pie Rocks. For whatever reason, the show decided to change the names of all of the Koopa kids. As a result, the character that we know as Wendy O'Koopa goes by Cootie Pie in the show. Ugh, Cootie Pie. Sounds like a tag on Pornhub. More than a few episodes of this series focus on Cootie Pie, and that really was not a good idea. They write her as an annoying crybaby who whines very, very loudly whenever she doesn't get her way. And here's the thing. If you write an annoying crybaby and you succeed, guess what? You're still stuck with an annoying crybaby! I wanna save Millie the Millie! I wanna! I wanna! I wanna! The episode begins with one of the other Koopa kids spying on the Mario Brothers as they get ready to take the princess to a concert in the real world. Next up, the real world, New York City. Wait, the real world? Does that mean the Mushroom Kingdom is not real in this universe? Has this just been a really adorable mass hallucination the entire time? Both worlds have the same cheap animation, so I don't really see much of a difference. Also, nobody told Mario and Luigi that they're going to a pop concert, hence why they're wearing tuxedos. Hey guys, why so formal? We're going to a Milli Vanilli concert, not a symphony. Hehehe, <laughs> sorry guys. Okay, you two are actually from the real world. You should know what a pop concert is better than the princess does. I mean, you're working class plumbers from New York. You've never been to one Springsteen show at the Garden? But it turns out Cootie Pie, ugh, I still hate it, is jealous and demands that Koopa kidnap Millie Vanilli so they'll perform for her. Yes, baby cakes. You not only get to see Silly the Willies. Millie Vanilli! So Koopa fires up his airship and heads off to where Millie Vanilli are, uh, <clears throat> presenting their concert. Hello, New York! Okay, I can't believe I'm saying this unironically, but shouldn't we be hearing Millie Vanilli's music right about now? Well, the version I'm showing you is from the DVD. The episode was never re-aired in its original form after the scandal broke, and the music was replaced with a generic instrumental from Captain N. And a few references to the group's songs were edited out as well. Blame it on the rain. <laughs> Blame it on King Koopa. <laughs> Blame it on King Koopa! If I had to guess, I doubt they would have bothered to relicense the music anyway because it was too expensive. I mean, they couldn't even be bothered to fix that animation mistake in either version. Deke was on brand to the bitter end. Anyway, Koopa shows up, kidnaps Robin Fab, and the Mario Brothers hurry back to the Mushroom Kingdom in order to save them. And here's something that really shocked me the first time I watched this episode. They let Robin Fab use their real voices. Hey, who's behind this Mondo Bizarro joke? We've got a concert to play. I really dig your dreadlocks. Huh? <laughs> well, I don't dig tails and scaly lips. So let me get this straight. Frank Farian didn't want Robin Fab to sing for the group that they fronted that was listened to by millions of people around the world despite the potential scandal it would bring, but providing their voices for the Mario cartoon was completely fine by him? We've already heard more of their real voices in those two lines than we have on any of their actual songs. Anyway, Cootie Pie ugh, demands that they perform for her. And when they refuse, she turns them into accountants. No! We're nuts. We're dweebs. This is terrible. Too bad she didn't turn you guys into attorneys. You needed that way more. You have to do what I want. Look, Ms. Reptile, we can't do the concert for you. We don't have the backup band. Okay, I don't want to be mean, but uh, that's never stopped you before. Anyway, Mario and the gang overhear that they need a backup band, so they decide to disguise themselves and sneak in. They trick Koop, ugh, Koopa's daughter into changing Robin Fab back to normal and proceed to rock out before escaping. Now, they're supposed to be playing an off-key version of Girl You Know It's True, but again, they replace the music, so the entire joke is lost. They could be playing any song in this scene and it would make just as much sense. Look at this photograph! <laughs> Nah, just kidding. And Koopa's daughter decides to join in by doing her Brendan Yuri impression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eh, still better than Viva yeah, Lost Vengeance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you promise to forget about them, I'm gonna put you in the dungeon. The dungeon? Okay, I promise. After all, it had to end sometime. That music was just too beautiful to last. <sighs> uh... 
<laughs> you wouldn't believe where we've been. But we're back, thanks to some new friends. This one's for a real princess. Oh, for fuck's sake, they have Fab's voice coming out of Rob's mouth. And what the hell happened to the princess's legs? Ugh, whatever, the episode's over. Okay, look. We've had some fun riffing on this episode, but I want to make something absolutely clear. A lot of people think it's still okay to make Millie Vanilli the target of ridicule. I don't. I'm not saying Rob and Fab were saints, but that doesn't change the fact that they were majorly exploited. And something that makes me upset about all the discourse about them at the time is that Rob and Fab were the targets instead of Frank Farian, the man who manipulated and exploited them. You know, a lot of people don't understand the enormous success of Mili Vanilli. And neither do we. <laughs> so act now because we are almost out of style. <laughs> People act like it was Rob and Fab's idea to lip sync as opposed to a situation that they couldn't get themselves out of. And I just think that's unfair. Especially considering nothing really changed in the music industry afterwards. Oh, new laws are on the books, sure, but those laws are either frequently ignored or circumvented when it comes to vocals on a pop record. And I'm not talking about auto-tune or pitch correction. Look up ghost vocals on YouTube sometime and see how record producers get around crediting singers. If people, they say, you know, are you the ghost voice for, <laughs> you heard that? I mean, I referenced the record for her, which is, you know, done a lot in the music industry, and they left my background vocals on there. At least Rob and Fab genuinely tried to be contrite and didn't give up hope on saving their reputations. What few people mention is that returning the Grammy for Best New Artist was their idea to begin with as a sign of good faith, but an interview with Farian claiming it was forced on them got to the press first and soured the whole thing. All those people at the Recording Academy, or the people who work for Arista Records, a r reps, recording engineers, MTV VJs, Clive Davis himself, there's no way they didn't know what was really going on, and they didn't care. This is Clive Davis. If a pen dropped in the building, he knew. And get this. Frank Farian still owns the rights to Millie Vanilli and still makes money off of them. I was shocked to find out that Millie Vanilli's music is still available on most streaming services, and the label publishing it appears to be Sony's German branch. You might have noticed I haven't included any of Millie Vanilli's songs in this video. That's because I couldn't. My earlier attempts would get copyright claimed even if I included as little as 10 seconds of music in the video. And I strongly suspect that would have gone directly into Frank Farian's pocket, so I just said to hell with it. By the way, Frank Farian, on the slim chance that you're watching this right now, fuck you. You should be ashamed of yourself. This wasn't even the first time Farian had done something like this. In the 1970s, Farian produced the disco act Boney M, which was fronted by Bobby Farrell, but featured vocals from Farian himself on all of the records. Farrell was only compensated with 100,000 marks for his image rights and died in obscurity in 2010. He deserve better, and Rob and Fab deserve better too, and while Rob is no longer with us, I can at least take some solace knowing that Fab has been able to move on with his life. Since Rob's passing, Fab Morvan has kept busy as a DJ, a public speaker, and yes, even recording new music. Turns out, he can sing just fine! You said you didn't need her You told her goodbye He's also been involved in several film projects and documentaries about Millie Vanilli, even saying that a major one is coming out soon that's going to be, quote, a major eye-opener. However those projects turn out, I'm just glad he finally gets to have his say. Because even with all of the scandal of Millie Vanilli, he still deserves a better legacy than this. No! We're nuts! We're dweebs! This is terrible! No! We're nerds! We're dweebs! This is terrible! You turn us back to normal people right now! We all know an accountant is not a people! Ah! I just wish we had time to rehearse! What good would that do? None of us knows how to play these things! Mario, I don't think I'm doing this right. Can't I just play guitar? 